So we're in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Now just as a curiosity thing before I jump in here, how many in here have been through all of Ecclesiastes so far with us? A few of us? A few of you? Some of you online maybe? Haven't been onto it? I would encourage you guys if you've not, you know, because it is actually pretty easy to go through it because it's not a super long book, but to, to, to be a part of that, you know, going through the book of the Bible is, is super helpful for, uh, you know, getting God's perspective on what he desires to say. And, you know, as some, you know, people that are out there in Christendom today, you know, kind of look down in some senses on the Hebrew scriptures, but we know, we know that all of the, you know, the New Testament is in the Old Testament sealed, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. You know, we know that the scriptures correspond, and this was the book that was preached from in the early church, the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, you know, so there's extreme validity to what we're looking at tonight. And the title of tonight's message that I put forth here is Death and Destiny. Death and Destiny. And I put a memory verse in here that's from Proverbs that may help us to kind of remember the, some of the text of the scripture tonight. Uh, Proverbs 23, 17, 18, it says, Do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day, for surely there is a hereafter and your hope will not be cut off. Now, just a quick, you know, touch of, you know, overview of where we've been at in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, I heard a really good outline when I first started studying the book. You know, the first chapter one through four speak in line with Solomon's search. You know, we see him sort of uh, philosophizing, if you will, laying out a philosophy and of searching for answers. And then in chapters 5 through 10, there's Solomon's sayings, things that he's said in respect to that. And then 11 and 12, the last two chapters, deal with Solomon's solutions to the matter. You know, and the more that I meditate on this, you know, because we you know, have, you know, been talking about it in this sense uh, that Solomon had kind of fallen away a bit. We know that from 1 Kings that his heart had strayed for love for other women and whatnot, but this being potentially an epitaph, sort of a final uh, thing that Solomon's laying out here, as, as I read through it and think through it more and more and more, uh, I almost wonder, because he does end the book of Ecclesiastes with the correct conclusion, right? Fear God, keep his commands. It talks about that. We're not you know, going all that deep into that tonight, that part of it, but you know, I wonder if it's just one of Solomon's last attempt efforts to kind of relate to people that have this uh, high-minded nature about them because he was obviously a ruler. He had affluence, you know, up around the world. He was world-renowned king at this time that maybe wrote some of these things and some of the things that we're looking at that, you know, has, has been mentioned before. It's not a what we would see as his, his perspective on some things are not like biblical doctrinal truth, but it is a correct view of Solomon's incorrect view, if you will, okay? Does that make sense? What we're seeing is a correct view of Solomon's incorrect view in some things, and some things he's hitting are right on the money, you know, and we, and we mentioned that. And then there is seasoned through the book the sense of God, and obviously ending on a high note. And I'm thinking in part, this is kind of like maybe a gospel tract that he wrote for other people that struggle and wrestle with this high-minded, analytical perspective of the things of life. You know, because as you get into this, you see him wrestling with these things, this under the sun premise, which he touches on a little bit in the text tonight concerning death, as we'll get into that. But um, I, you know, I wonder about that. You know, and, and as the Proverbs, you know, we quoted a proverb there, it says Solomon wrote over 3,000. We know that there's 800, around 800 or so, a third of that in the Bible. So, you know, a third of what he wrote in terms of Proverbs were actually God said, all right, we'll keep this, the other two thirds. I don't know where you're going with that. But, you know, but God's allowed that to be made here for us. And as we're approaching tonight, you know, this, some of the topics in here, you know, death and destiny. There are a lot of things in our world today, it's important for us to, to be very 
much more keen and more sharp in our awareness of knowing that people in our workplaces, people in our, you know, immediate families and some of our, uh, you know, not necessarily immediate families, but, you know, people that are close to us family-wise have wrong perspectives about the gospel, wrong perspectives about church, wrong perspectives about discipleship. And it's important for us to be aware of that because I think sometimes we can get in here and circle around the Bible, hear a Bible study, listen to things, and kind of miss this sense of knowing that there's people around us that are completely, and I mean completely confused, about what it means to be in a relationship with God, what it means when we approach this thing called death and what happens thereafter. It's important that we keep that highly aware in our minds because you just never know as we sow and seed what the Lord might do. You know, I love some of the things, I was reading some of this before I jumped out, you know, that uh, one commentator I heard speaking of his relationship with this world, with the Lord and in this, in this world says, you know, I have one foot in heaven and one foot on earth. And the one foot that's standing on earth is standing on a banana peel. <laughs> Although it's funny because it's speaking of the uncertainty of when death's going to come into his life. There was, um, there was a kid that was listening to a pastor teach, and he talked to the pastor. And he said, Pastor, I was trying to understand if I heard you correctly. You said that in your message that we come from the dust of the earth. Is that right? And the, and the pastor said, yeah, that's right. You're listening. That's good. You're listening. You're paying attention. And then he said, and I also heard you say that we we'll also will return to dust. You know, from the dust we came and from dust, you know, we'll go back to when we die. And he said, yeah, you heard right. That's right. And he said, I want you to come over to my house because I'm looking under my bed and I don't know if there's people coming or going under here. <laughs> He's talking about the dirtiness of his bed. And, and, and the truth is, is we don't know, you know, when our time is, when we're coming or going. There's a, another funny thing I read. It says there's three friends that died in a car crash and, um, and they went, you know, up toward heaven and, and met a man there and, and the guy said, you know, what would you like to be said people to say of you while you're at your funeral. And the first guy said, well, you know, I'd like people to say of me at my funeral that uh, I was a great doctor and I was a good family man. He said, okay, well, what about you, the second guy? And he said, well, I'd love people to look at me and say, man, I was a great father to my children and a loving husband to my, to my wife and, um, and that and I was a great teacher because that's, you know, what I did for a living. He said, oh, well, cool, that's, that's good. And looked at the third guy and he said, what would, what would you like you know, people to say at your funeral? And he said, I'd like him to say, look, he's moving. <laughs> I thought it was funny. But, he was, but, he was, uh, <laughs> but it was a guy that maybe wasn't ready to die yet. You know, and I keep think of you know, when we look at our life and our purpose, I think this uh, story, I can't remember the name of the missionary, I think, was in Africa. Pastor David had told once but, um, you know, they, he had died in a, in a sort of an early age pursuing a call of God on his life. And they had found uh, on a small piece of paper written in his tent, you know, when he had passed away at an early age, it said, no retreats, no reserves, and no regrets. And I think that's the pursuit of our relationship with the Lord on that day-to-day -day basis as we look at the things tonight. Is, is a desire that God wants each of us to have. And so we're going to jump in here and go through some of these things together and um, see what the Lord has to say. Verse 1, I'm going to read the first three verses. The first one through three speaks of death being for all people. It says in verse 1, For I consider all of this in my heart. What is that he's talking about? He's talking about actually part of what he was musing over in chapter 8 which, you know, Steve did a really good job teaching on these things, speaking of death, the fear of God, and contemplating the works of men. So Solomon's considering all this in his heart, it says here in verse 1, so that I could declare it all. So there's a consideration before declaring it, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. People know neither love nor hatred by anything they see before them. All things come alike to all. One event happens to the righteous, 
and the wicked, to the good, the clean, and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As is the good, so is the sinner. He who takes an oath as he who fears an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that one thing happens to all. Truly the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. You know, as we're looking at this and considering it, you know, it says, I consider the work in my heart all this in my heart, that the, the, the righteous, the wise, their works are in the hand of God. You know, um, I think it was Corey Tim Boom that said, you know, um, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow in the hand of God. That the works that those of us, it's speaking more specifically because he'll contrast this as we go through this, of the righteous and the wise are in the hand of God. So we're seeing not just the works of the evil, but those that are righteous in God. And we know Ephesians 2.10 says that we are his workmanship. That Greek word in, you know, some of this is in a school of discipleship, by the way. If you've not signed up for school of discipleship, how many of you has taken school of discipleship? Let's do that. So everybody else that is not raising your hand, sign up for school of discipleship, right? We'll tell her, get the hand out. Come on, sign up. No, but... Um, the clipboard sign up. Now we encourage you to do that. This verse is in uh, part of the memory work of school of discipleship, but we're his workmanship. That word workmanship in Ephesians 2.10 is poema in the Greek where we get our word poem. We, the works of God, of the righteous in God's hand, it's, it's we are his poem. We're his story that's being written for the world to see. And I think it's a blessing for us to know that. And I put just some stuff down here and made me think through this. How, how can we know that we're walking in his works? Well, if we're following his promise, promises, his promptings, he'll give us his purpose that we can see that we are being a story that's written, a poema that's written. And that will develop our proper perception of our personal relationship with Jesus. Having the promises, right, gives us, and having those promptings as it relates to the promises. The Bible's got 2,000 plus promises for us in it. You know, and there's nuances to each one of those promises as we seek to apply them. As we're pursuing those things, we are, the poemum of God is being developed in us. You know, we're going to see the Romans 8, 28, all things working, as it says in this verse, the workmanship of God for his good to those that love God, right? We are being, he's working it in us. Now, as he's working it in us, I love this next part. It says, people neither know love nor hatred by anything that they see before him. Well, what does that mean? I think it means just simply that it's really hard for us to read situations. You know, we can't live by just natural sight, interpreting events and things that are going on to people around us, or even sometimes ourself, things that God's doing in our life. Sometimes we can't really get a good read on it by our natural walk, but as seeing physically. We have to walk by faith and not by sight. You know, I mean, for example, you know, if you saw me in my life, you're able to take this little video snippet on God's camera, right, (laughs) of my life, of me just disciplining my kids. And that's all that you ever saw of me, right? You would think, you know, that guy seems hateful. (laughs) Look at the way he's doing that with his child, you know? But if you saw the whole process and I'll discipline my kids. You might, wow, that's a real loving thing that he did there. But you neither know love nor hatred sometimes by those things. In a similar sense, you know, I'm, some people maybe, we, people tend to judge on this feltness of, you know, like, oh man, I'm feeling you, you know, as opposed to God who judges what? The heart, right? Which is really, it's unseen, you know. I mean, and Grant ain't to say you can't, witness something and know it's from the Lord or not. I ain't saying that. But sometimes we don't know. You know, if a person is doing something for the glory of God or maybe they got a malicious motive mixed into that, right? We don't know what, what to see. And it says, all things come to all alike. This event that is speaking of in this first three verses, the one event that happens to the righteous and to the wicked, that, you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, to the good 
the clean, you know, people that take baths and the unclean, the people that don't, you know, I was just speaking more in a spiritual sense to those that make sacrifices and worship God, those that don't sacrifice and worship God. As the good, so is the sinner. He who takes an oath, he who fears an oath. You know, it's simply saying, Solomon's saying, there's death is no respecter of persons. It's no respecter of persons. It comes to all. Now, the fact that this event happens to us all, right, doesn't mean that how we die is very different. You know, we got the thief on the cross, two thieves on the cross. We see the one thief humble, submitted to Jesus, and one mocking and cursing Jesus, right? You know, both entering into that one event of death. So their responses are different. And the destination's very different. We'll get into that in a minute. But, you know, there's two things that we know that will last forever. The Word of God and the human soul will last forever and ever. There's a fun little thing that's written on a tombstone, or I heard it was written on a tombstone somewhere. It says, and this was written on the tombstone as people walk by. It says, Paul, stranger, as you pass me by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare for death and follow me. And some visitor wrote on a sign next to you, next to this tombstone. It says, to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> and this is, the thing about death and entering into that event that we're all going to face, right? You know, which way is the right way to go? Now, verse 3 through 6, we're going to tackle some of this. It says here in chapter 9 of Ecclesiastes, this is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that one thing happens to all. Truly the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts, and while they live, and after that they do not, they go to the dead. But for him who is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. And also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. Now, I'm going to pick this apart a little bit. This is actually a wrong perspective of death. This is a wrong perspective of death. You know, there's a story I was listening to of a, a family that went to the beach. He had a little four-year-old kid, and they walk out on the beach. And this kid's walking out on the beach, and he sees a dead seagull. It's pretty gross, right? Dead seagull on the beach. And he's kind of freaked out about it. He's like, Daddy, 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 what happened? What happened? What happened? You know, he sees this dead bird on the beach. And his dad said to him, trying to be nice and, and make it over good with his son and sounding nice, he said, Oh, son, uh, it, it, it's okay. You know, he, he's just, he's died and, uh, and, he, and he went to heaven. And uh, it's okay. And the boy sat around and thought for a minute. So, like, so he went to heaven and he's with the Lord. Did God not want him? He threw him back? Is that why he's here now? You know? <laughs> it's just throw the bird down. You know, and, and, and it's, this is kind of funny, but it's, but it's a wrong perspective, right? And you know, and this is a thing. A lot of people have a wrong perspective as we enter into this concept of death. People, you know, there's a lot of things. People don't like to think about it. That's part of it. Even though it happens to everybody. You know, statistical fact. You know, um, or they believe it's all good. Like, you know, it don't matter what you believe about death. You know, it's all going to be good. Just, it's all going to be good. Why do you know that? You know, you start asking some critical questions to get to the bottom. Why do you know about what's going to happen after you die? Well, I just believe something good. Be okay. And there's no depth to it sometimes. You know, the guy I was talking to the other day, you know, it was just, we're talking about, yeah, 2020 is moving along. You know, it's fast, it's fast. It's like, yeah. And I said, next thing you know, we'll be picking out our tombstones. Like, oh, that's kind of a bad, <laughs> that's a weird thought. You know, it was just like, well, you know, man, I mean, we all die, dude. You know, the question, I just said, you know, 
The question is, is we had our, that come to Jesus moment. And this is an older guy older than me, you know. And he was kind of put, put off about it, you know, not, not knowing what to say or what to think. You know, it was just kind of a casual conversation I was having with him. But it's, people aren't prepared to think this thing through. And I can say safely, you know, that I've had, and I'm, I try to be sensitive in understanding these things. I understand it's difficult to deal with a thing like death. You know, I personally, you know, I was raised in a family with four children, uh, you know, mom and dad. Uh, it's a fair-sized family, and half of them are gone. You know, one died at nine, a brother, and sister died at 27, mom died at 41. I had a niece, you know, that passed away. We did a funeral here, just three years old. I'm very familiar with the sting that death brings into, into our lives. And it's important as you think this thing through. I mean, you know, it's funny. One of the people in my family that passed away, without getting into super amount of details, you know, they had a life insurance policy uh, on this person, and there was a small thing that wasn't, just a very small thing. It wasn't a big thing, but it was a small thing on there that wasn't filled out properly. And this person passed away, and there was no way for them to absorb any sort of cost for a funeral or anything because they would not cash that life insurance policy out because it was not done properly. And as I was thinking about that, I think, you know, eternal life, our relationship with Jesus that's assured through Jesus, through the gospel. You know, there's a lot of people that have wrong beliefs that are not going to cash in to receive eternal life because they're predicating it on something that's not Jesus. And it's with something we need to be aware of. You know, he says, just read through this, uh, three through six real quickly. You know, that uh, this is an evil done under the sun. One thing happens to all. Truly, the hearts of sons and men are evil. You know, Jeremiah says the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. You want to see how evil your heart is? Go through the commandments. Ask a couple questions. Have you lied? Have you stolen? I mean, you start stacking up your sins and looking at them for a minute. You're like, whoa, you know, what does God want anything to do with me for, right? You see how evil that we really are. But there is hope. The living, with the living, there's hope. And he uses this for a living dog is better than a dead lion. Now, this is not speaking positively of dogs, okay? Now, some of you have dogs, you love your animal. It's okay, Proverbs tells you to love your animal. You know, in this time period, this is not like a good compliment. A living dog, you know, people have domesticated their animals, make them think like they're humans. They say, oh, you know, my dog has all these preferences and stuff. No, you got mental preferences that you think your dog has. <laughs> but, it's, but it's just, you know, a living dog, is better, anything alive is better than anything dead. That's great and glorious, right? That's what's being said here. You know, I like this phrase I wrote down, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. You know, we're born once into sin, and if we don't get born again, we die again, fraternally. It says, for the living know they will die, but the dead know nothing. This is... And it says, and they will have no more reward, and the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and now perish, never more they shall have to share under anything under the sun. A lot of these statements here are not 100% true. What do I mean? The dead know nothing. Well, there's a sense that Solomon's saying there in verse 5 that there's no, there's, there's no feeling, no consciousness, no any of that after you pass to, this, to death. And the thing is, is we don't go to death. We go through death. That's, that's the thing for us, spiritually speaking. We don't go to death. We go through death. And we know clearly, obviously, from the New Testament, actually in the Hebrew Scriptures, that there is much more than just the dead and that being it. You know, in the Old Testament, we know, I've got a couple of things here for you guys, that uh, hell, which is actually... Um, spelled out a little different in the New Testament, but it's Sheol, and it's a Hades or an underworld. It's a place of the dead where it's kind of a compartment for the dead. And we know that in the Old Testament that um, 
You know, it's interesting because I looked this up. You know, Solomon didn't say anything about this compartment or this place of the dead. When he talks about dying and death, he's talking about it with a finality sense. Nowhere in the Proverbs, any of his writings that I've seen. I don't read Hebrew, so maybe there's another word missing there that I'm not seeing, but he doesn't use this word Sheol at all when he's talking about the place of the dead. And in the New Testament, there's at least uh, three different perspectives, three different things. You know, you, you just read your Bible, you read the word hell, right, in English, but there's actually three different Greek words that are used to describe what's happening. In uh, 2 Peter 2, 4, it says, For God did not despair the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them to chains of darkness to preserve for judgment. And this is actually the only time this word hell is translated like this in the New Testament. It's Tartaru, Tartarus, which is, it says the deepest abyss of Hades to incarcerate in eternal torment. So there's that one time it's mentioned. It's mentioned in relationship to angelic beings. I don't know if that means that hell is, you know, there's an extra layer just with angels in it or fallen angels in it, maybe that's what's meant. Because we see in other places, Hades mentioned in the New Testament. This is um, properly unseen Hades or the place or the state of departed souls. Now what we see in the New Testament, Luke chapter 16, right? There's two compartments. There's the compartment of Abraham's bosom that, you know, is sort of a paradise. And then there's the compartment we saw the rich man in hell. Now we know this is not the final, absolute final place of hell. This is not what really hell is going to be like when earth is wrapped up, all said and done, the great white throne judgment, all that's, you know, in the past when that happens. This is not what it's going to be. This is a compartment holding until that day, the great day of judgment. And we see hell used another word in the New Testament that's more specific to that, Gehenna. It's uh, the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Jerusalem used figuratively as a name, place, or state of everlasting punishment. You know, it uh, was actually like uh, or trash piles that were outside burning up continually. There's fires that were burned up continually where refuse was burned that was used as a description of hell. And it's actually the second death. So there's those things that happen when we die. And obviously heaven, paradise is a part of that as well. Now it says there's no more reward. Their memory of them is forgotten. Now those of us that are in Christ, we know that there's reward for us that are in Christ, right? This is not just some aimless, went to death and that was it. Hopefully somebody remembers you. That's what, you know, people that don't believe in Jesus, they hope they have some sort of memory here on earth. That's kind of like the aim, the goal, the objective. It's like, yeah, I died, but you know, I'm, you know I wrote a book or I did this or did that and I try to have some memory of myself here on earth or a memorial on earth about who I was. But in Christ, you know, there's the Bema seat. We have a reward there. We see in Hebrews 6, 10 through 12, it says, For God's not unjust to forget your work. God does not forget the labor of love which you've shown toward his name, that if you are a minister to the saints and do minister, we desire that each of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those through faith and patience. Inherit the promise God doesn't forget, and that encourages us that we walk in the same diligence, the first works, right? Jesus talks about in Revelation, that fresh fire that we first have with God is to continue in being diligent in that end because we know we don't want to be sluggish, right, is what it says there, but imitate through faith and patience. Malachi 16, 3, 16, those that fear the Lord spoke together and listened to him, and a book of remembrance was written before him. For those that fear the Lord and meditate on his name. You know, a lot of times when I get in a situation where I'm confused or I'm conflicted or I'm confounded by problems and a lot of things that goes on, a lot of times it can be simply attributed to not considering or remembering all the good that God has done in my life with thanksgiving, right? Talks about that in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, the way to peace, you know, that we're thankful to God. Philippians 4, 8, remembering whatever is good, pure, true, and loving. That's the counting your blessings, allowing it to resonate, allowing the roots of our thankfulness and our gratitude. It says gratitude determines the altitude of your relationship with God. You've heard that maybe before, but it's, it's, it's something that we got to consider in our own personal walks to benefit and bless us. It says their love and the hatred, envy is perished. 
You know, this is true for those that are outside of Christ. It is true for outside of those outside of Christ. Memory of them will be forgotten. It won't be remembered. For those, they won't have no reward. But in Christ, we're remembered, and there is memories that God records. And it says in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, no foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, you're building your life on Jesus with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. Each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it. That day will declare it. You don't have to speculate over everybody else's, they're doing this, they're doing that. You know, just the day will declare because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he's built on it endures will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as though through fire. And nevermore they will have any share of anything under the sun. Now, this again is true for the unbeliever, but for the believer, we're supposed to come back. The thousand year millennial reign of Christ, it talks about. I put a life lesson here. It says that death is certain, but our life in Christ is more certain. It brings memories, works, and impact that will last forever. So there's something substantive about who we are in Jesus. Now, verse 7 through 10, it says, that seven, it says, this is, it does contrast, it talks about death, then Solomon kind of switches gears and talks about, you know, because of death, how should we live, right? It says in verse 7 through 10, it says, light, life in the light of death, go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already accepted your works. Add joy, one of the things I put here is that add joy to our meals, to our times of fellowship and eating, you know, maybe it's with our family. You know, Acts 2.42 talks about, uh, you know, eating and fellowshipping with other believers. This is the thing that God wants us to have in our life is joy. You know, we can add joy to our life by, you know, or our meals by, you know, not complaining. That's a good, good way, <laughs> not having joy. You know, Solomon, I think three times in the book of Proverbs talks about, um, in contrast, it says Proverbs 17, 1, it's better is a dry crust of bread with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting. Solomon had massive wealth and he's been around these feasting tables where there's strife. He says, you know what? I better be chewing on a pizza crust over here in my quietness, you know what I mean? Just hanging out and being at peace. That's all I want. You know, he understood this thing. Because it says God's already accepted your work. So adding joy to our meals. Verse 8, it says, let your garments always be white and let your head lack no oil. There's joy here in our routine. Let your garments always be white. Let your head lack no oil. There's, you know, speaking of oil would be sort of like a perfume type thing that would be put on the head. You know, most of the time when people would change their clothes in ancient world, it wasn't like, you know, they would do this often. Most of the time, it only happened around a time of a wedding ceremony. And I think it's interesting because we're called to be the bride of Christ to be prepared for the king's return. You know, he talks about that, uses that illustration, you know, in Ephesians, he uses that, talking about the five virgins, you know, waiting for the groom to come, or the 10 virgins, wise and the five, five wise, five foolish, but those having their oil, being ready, being filled with the Spirit, being ready for the Lord's return. This is a way of life, you know, adding, adding these things into our routines and our day-to-day -day life. Continue to keep joy in that. Verse 9, I put, it says, live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life. That, that kind of is like a weird compliment, right? You see Solomon looking at a cute couple over here. Oh, enjoy your wife, your vain little life. You know, <laughs> just like, come on, man. <laughs> Trying to ruin it for me here, man. But he's, you know, saying, just saying that life is short and uncertain. That's sort of the meaning of what he's saying there in verse 9. The life which has been given to you under the sun, all your days of vanity, for that is your portion in life and in the labor which you perform under the sun. Adding joy to our marriage. While we're here in this world, in the light of the fact we're going to die, adding joy to our meals, joy to a 
routine, joy in our marriage. And, and, and this is a challenge. I say it's a challenge because I'm married and I have three kids under three years old, and it's a challenge. <laughs> I'm saying I need some prayers here, please. No, it's, it's, uh, it's a joy. It's truly a joy, and I think my wife would say the same. It's, it's a joy. Uh, we have four total, but three under three. That's what I call them. And uh, a few more months before that will change. But it, it's a, it's a, it is a joy, but it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Sometimes we have to work at allowing margin to be in our relationship for the right kind of fellowship that we need in our marriage. And it's, it's a lifelong challenge. I know many of you that are married would probably attest to that and, and could speak to me more about that because you have more experience than I do. But it's, um, it is a thing, you know, one few things to keep joy more strong in your marriage. Christ-centeredness, Jesus being king, over both of your lives. He being his word, his spirit, his nature being the default. Like, hey, this is what we're gonna default to. This is what Jesus told us to do. That's been a huge blessing for, for me in, in marriage, is knowing that my wife's going that same direction, I'm going that same direction. I'm still challenging. Committed love. 100% full-on committed love. None of this talk about, you know, um, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stay committed, love, unless this happens or that happens, you know. But none of that, man. Just to stay committed. All in, man. Till death do us part, man. And don't think any nasty things about killing your spouse, okay? But, but you know, it's, 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 it's that kind of commitment. And, uh, you know, it helps bring joy into the marriage. Christ-centeredness, committed love, communication. You know, it's try to understand one another. Be nice, be gentle, be humble, say you're sorry. You know, these are ingredients that poured into a marriage can help facilitate an atmosphere for, for joy to be produced in that marriage, right? It is challenging, man. It is, it's, no doubt it's a challenge. Nobody's saying this is all a piece of cake and, and it's all easy, you know, it's... Um, Solomon wrestles with and we see him struggling with things that he, he don't know. Oftentimes I struggle with what I do know more than what I don't know, you know. I know that I'm supposed to do, you know, follow Jesus and be this kind of man at my house. I struggle more with that than I do with the stuff that I don't know, right? You know, love, love one another and all that kind of stuff, you know. Enjoying your wife. Being an enabler of joy. Also, verse 10, it says, whatever your hand finds to do, whatever, what your hand trying to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Jesus says in the New Testament, night's soon coming in which no man can work. You know, we know the Colossians 3.23, work heartily, as unto the Lord and not unto men, right? How do we get joy in our work? Doing it with our might. You know, I, 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 one of the things that I, I see where I find great joy and fulfillment is if a task is given to me and I'm actually able to fully, in my, all my mind, all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, do it unto the Lord. And what gets difficult is when I start getting those distractions poured in on the side. You know, this thing comes over here, that thing happens over there. And next thing you know, I was, I was doing it. I was on this track, you know, I was going on that all my head. Go all, all in, Lord. All of a sudden, I'm like not able to give it all my might, you know. And, and this is a thing, you know, it's, um, it's a challenge as well. But having that, allowing, asking God to give you the grace and give you the ability to not be distracted, to just hone in the thing that he's called you to do, be it at work, at your job, your vocation. Maybe it's serving in the body of Christ here. You know what I mean? Um, you know, getting in there and just, if it's sparkle, making it just bam, the way that it should be, the best that it can be, right? Or it's, it's uh, teaching kids, bam, the best that it can be, right? And don't, you know, beat yourself to death. You know, I am this kind of person just freely admit this, you know, I make up standards too high to reach, like all the time. 
<laughs> you know, it's like a story of my life. My standards are like way up here and I'm hitting about right here, you know. But hey, you aim for the stars, you hit the moon, you at least went somewhere, right? <laughs> you know, it's like I got out, I got somewhere, didn't it? But you know, it's, it is that heart attitude though, that heart attitude toward the Lord, knowing that he is gracious and that he is good and that he forgives us when we're stumbling around, seeking to walk in his fullness and he's merciful in those senses. But man, it, it is something to be said to be able to put in the fullness of everything you do in your work. The life lesson is we need to allow the spirit to work joy into our meals, into our routines, into your marriage, and into your work. Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, yes, always. That's from a man in prison. Every reason to complain, but we don't really hear a lot of that complaining, do we? Because he knew what it meant to have joy. I was thinking of him as Silas and Paul in the stocks, you know, in the book of Acts. You know, I just can't stand to be still sometimes. I can imagine, you know, rejoicing in the Lord with your hands in like stocks, unable to move and your feet unable to move. You know, I'd have like some mosquito on my face and be like, oh, God. You know, I don't know how you could rejoice doing that. But you, know, but, but, you know, finding a way, God can make a way for us through the Holy Spirit to rejoice in all things. If he can do that with Paul, he can do it certainly with us. He's able, right? He's able. I put 2 Corinthians 1.24. I think it's a great verse. You know, Paul speaking to the Corinthians about his desire in interacting in discipleship with them. He says this, but that does not mean that we want to dominate you by telling you how to put your faith into practice. We want to work together with you so you will be full of joy for it is by your own faith that you stand firm this this is our walk with jesus man it's not you know jesus talks about you know the gen, the rulers the gentiles they lord it over one another not no nah, not not with you guys it's a different kind of leadership here all right this is the washing the feet kind of stuff that's the thing we do we wash one another's feet we try to work so that you can have the joy of god more full in your life you know, as we share from things from the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, maybe he's hitting you in different ways than he's hitting me, even as I'm sharing, right? But, you know, that's meant to, to bring you joy, a more full joy in the Lord. You know, maybe it's not you're at a place where you know you shouldn't be or, or not at, and you're struggling with that, you know? And, and it is a cause for, for us to reexamine, hey, you know, Lord, what, what's going on? You know, I like this phrase Billy Sunday said. It says, if you have no joy in your Christianity, there must be a leak somewhere. There's a leak. Right? Allow that accountability of being in fellowship. Allow that interacting with one another, praying with one another, bearing one another's burdens, right? That comes from being connected. And the more interconnected and intertwined you are with the body of believers, the more opportunity to love on one another, to minister to one another, exists. It's not to say there's people who've never been hurt at church or, I mean, are never going to have a bad experience at church. All that's going to happen anywhere you live, whether anywhere on earth. That's the bad stuff's going to happen to anybody. But the point is, is that you continue because you trust in the promises of God. You trust in what God says in his word about what it means to be intertwined and closely connected with one another in fellowship, submitted to elders, to deacons, things like that mentioned in the Bible. It's for your health and your benefit. So when you start leaking, somebody's like, hey, bro, you leaking? <laughs> you know, let's put a patch on that, right? The blood of Jesus, cover that. Get that joy back in there. Now, verse 11 and 12. It says, it talks about sudden death. And this is not like overtime in a sports game, right? He says, I returned and I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. You know, this is, a uh, sovereignty thing of God's providence. You know, we think in the human realm, when well, that guy's really fast, he should win. But then he doesn't. Or that guy, man, he's, he's really strong. He should win. 
but that's not his battle. You know, the riches of men, nor the riches of men of understanding. You know, I think of the, you know, a lot of, we're, we're overly politicized these days in my view, but, you know, the guy that was super rich billionaire for the Democratic primaries, Bloomberg, I think is his name, Mayor Bloomberg. Millions of dollars. He should win. He spent half a million dollars, or 500, half a billion dollars. 500 million dollars. I'm like, dude, you could just pay every American a million dollars. I would have voted for you for a million dollars, okay? I know you wouldn't win. That's why I voted for you, but <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, he didn't win. He had to quit like a week ago or so. And I'm not having a bias toward anything like that. I'm just saying, you know, it's kind of fitting to our text here. No riches to men with understanding or favor to men with skill, but time and chance happened to them all. I heard an interpretation of this that says that God, sometimes time will, will come when he allows events to overcome a person. Sometimes he'll allow that to happen. You know, we see the athletics mentioned here, military service, industry, and economy mentioned with these examples. Verse 12, it says, for a man does not know his time. Like a fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare, so the sons of men are ensnared in the evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. You know, he uses the example, you got a fish just swimming around the ocean, going to school, right? School of fish. <laughs> Caught up. It's done. And we see it, right? You know, we mentioned a few weeks ago the thing with Kobe Bryant, you know, just a very popular, you know, probably the top five or ten at least of all, you know, basketball players, and all of a sudden, shoo, death just shoo, at an early age. And the best don't always win. They even get swept away by death unexpectedly. Hmm. You know, this, from a human perspective, we look at, you know, the providence of this and, or look at it and you think, man, this is just tragic, right? But from a divine perspective, sometimes something, suddenly something happens in our own lives, right? And we can see from a divine perspective later how awesome and beneficial and blessed it really is, you know? I mean, I can think of a number of things in, in, um, in, my, in my own life. It's like this phrase... It says, God's ways are behind the scenes, but he moves all the scenes that he's behind. You know, we see, see, see in my own life how God weaves events together. Sometimes it takes, you know, three or four or five, ten years in retrospect to look back and see, whoa, I see the Lord working there providentially. And, and, I, and I didn't see it at that time. And that time it just came upon me like, you know, death in this situation, but it just came upon me suddenly. I didn't know how to respond or react, you know. You know, it just so happened that I came back to this church in 2010, 2011, started serving on Saturday Sparkle, and it just so happened that I met my wife, right? <laughs> Future wife at that time, <laughs> with my wife then. It just so happens, right? It just so happens that my work at that time said you can't, be gone, you have to come in on work Saturday. So I had to quit serving. And it just so happened I talked to Pastor D.A. said, man, I was trying to serve God, man. What am I supposed to do? I said, well, as I said, there's somebody I should serve. And he said, well, you got a kids. Maybe you can teach kids. Okay, teach kids. Just so happened I start teaching kids. It just so happens the children's pastor, Pastor Mike, feels led and called to go to Virginia. He's gone, right? It just so happens, you know, that you know, that, that uh, there's a greater need for me to be here and help serve in that capacity, right? It all just so happens. And the Lord, we see the Lord working through all these things in hindsight. Maybe initially it wasn't like so exciting, but we see him working behind the scenes. And just like he providentially is working in the lives of people, even with death behind the scenes. The life lesson I put is that God's providence is on the hand of the diligent in death and discipleship. You know, I think of just my own relationship and coming to the Lord, you know. 
I don't know if I would have came to Christ apart from my own mother who tried to disciple and pray for me passing away. I mean, I was in some unsavory circles with some unsavory people doing things that was wrong, you know, in a nutshell. And yet this, her, through that death, you know, that God providentially brought me, no doubt, brought me into the kingdom. It just so happens, right? God working these things together. In verse 13 through 15, we see wisdom is unrecognized. It says, this wisdom I've also seen under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with a few men in it, and a great king came against it, besieged it, and built snares around it. And now there was some, found in it a poor, wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city, yet no one remembered the same poor man. Now I find this interesting. This is a real event that happened. We're going to read this account. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 14 through 22. Maybe Solomon's alluding to this event in Ecclesiastes. I don't know. It says, but this is the backdrop of this story. Is so basically the Absalom rebellion had taken place. Um, and David's kingdom had been done. And then another man named Sheba had rised up in rebellion against David. And he was moving, it says here, we'll pick up in verse 14. If you want to go back and read the chapter in full, you can read it. Verse 14, it says, Meanwhile, Sheba traveled through all the tribes of Israel and eventually came to a town of Abel Beth Micaiah. And all the members of his own clan, the Berechites, assembled for battle and followed him into the town. So there's this rebellion this guy has led. He's hiding through the tribes of Israel. And then it says, when Joab's forces arrived, and this is a pretty well unknown town, right? <laughs> Abel, Beth, Micaiah. But uh, it says, they attacked Abel, Beth, Micaiah, and they built a huge siege ramp against the town's fortifications, began battering down the wall. Verse 16, but a wise woman in the town called out to Joab, listen to me, Joab, come over here so I can talk to you. And as he approached, the woman asked, are you Joab? I am, he said. So she said, listen carefully to your servant. I'm listening, he said. And then she continued. There used to be a saying, if you want to settle an argument, ask advice at the town of Abel. I'm the one who's peace-loving and faithful in Israel, but you're destroying an important town in Israel. Why do you want to devour what belongs to the Lord? And Joab replied, believe me, I do not want to destroy your town. Devour or destroy your town. That's not my purpose. All I want is a man named Sheba, the son of Berechai, from the hill country of Ephraim, who has revolted against King David. If you hand over this one to me, I will leave the town in peace again. The lady's like, uh, all right. The woman replied, we will throw his head over the wall to you. Sounds like a strange thing. Then the woman went to all the people with her wise advice, and they cut off Sheba's head and threw it out to Joab. And he blew the ram's horn and called his troop backs from the attack. And they all returned to their homes, and Joab returned to the king at Jerusalem. So if you want to get ahead in life, <laughs> receive God's wisdom that's from above and impeachable and full of good fruits, right? You know, get ahead. But, uh, you know, so we see this thing, in a sense, played out here. This would have been when Solomon was probably a kid, you know, um, a town having all this stuff surrounding it, being besieged, and a wise person, in this case, a woman, Stepping in instead of getting the town destroyed, just not like Jonah. I want to say like Jonah, but it definitely wasn't like Jonah, right? <laughs> but she, she got ahead of the curve there. And um, no one remembered the same poor person. So we don't even know this lady's name or anything like that. But we see that God used this moment. And, and it's often like that. You know, we, you know, we often remember a singer, but we don't remember a songwriter. Or we remember an actor in a movie, but we don't know who the screenwriter is. You know, we, we see uh, a politician, but not the campaign manager. You know, there was a, you may, may have heard this guy's name before, a guy named Johann von Stapitz. Stapitz. Has anybody ever heard of that name? Other than me just saying it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I just heard of it right now. No, but um, he's actually was instrumental in helping Martin Luther be encouraged 
during the time he was wrestling with some of the things going on with the Catholic Church and gave him enough courage to actually start the Reformation. You can read about it. Martin Luther said, dude, if it wasn't for this guy, I wouldn't even been here. We don't know who is this guy. There's a guy. I don't have his picture on a wall. There ain't no month of remembering him, you know. I don't even know if he's in our Reform and Reformation stuff in the Bible exhibit. That'd be a good thing to check on later. But, you know, we don't remember that. You know, you think of Dwight L. Moody, you know, huge evangelist, great impact for the kingdom. Most people don't know Edward Kimball, who had to, it was just took enough courage to witness to this guy as he was stalking to see him be born again. The point is, is that anonymous doesn't necessarily mean unnecessary. And the point is for us is, you know, we don't want to stop ministering and serving the Lord just because we're unknown or we're unappreciated or unrecognized. We continue to serve. I mean, I would not be standing here speaking with you if it wasn't for many of you, many, maybe, maybe people watching, some people that, that aren't able to be here tonight for whatever reason, many of deacons, many of elders that were a part of encouraging my relationship with the Lord, helping me not give up, helping me to continue in my walk with God. It's important for us to note of. In the last couple of verses here, and we'll close up, verse 16 through 18. Wisdom is despised. This kind of builds on the last point there in verse 16. It says, Then I said, Wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised. Kind of alluding to the poor man in the city that wasn't known, even though he helped deliver the city. And his words are not heard. Words of the wise, quietly spoken, should be heard rather than the shout of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. So we see how these a couple things mentioned in here, or more than a couple things, wisdom's better than strength, better than weapons of war. I mean, you know, obviously that's counter to what a lot of us think in our culture. I mean, you know, if you see, you know, skinny old, Bean pole me standing here, and you see some, you know, what the world's strongest man come out here, just, <laughs> like, oh wow, look at that guy, you know, he's just awesome, you know, you know, initially, right, you get that impression, but just by the visual stuff, or you know, you see the guy that has never touched a gun in his life, and then you got a guy that's got an arsenal that has like, you know, fascinated in all kinds of the nuanced military equipment. All these major weapons is trained and, you know, this artillery and stuff like that. Doesn't matter. The wisdom of God's better than that. According to God, the wisdom of God is better than that. I ain't saying that all those things are wrong. So if you're buff, if you're a weapon specialist, God bless you. <laughs> Maybe you can have God's wisdom and that. That'd be, you know, super awesome. You know, but it's also noted that it's despised. I like this text. It's a few verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 through 31. Paul says this. It says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has God not made the foolish the wisdom of the world, this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom, the world's wisdom, did not believe or did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. 
and the base things of the world which are, are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things which are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So we see Paul just laying out this full case for the gospel, that it's foolish. <laughs> Come join the foolish cause of the kingdom. You know, doesn't sound that, I don't know. <laughs> you know. It's foolish to the world. It's foolish to people that are perishing apart from God. This is not to say that, you know, we try to grow and love the Lord with all our mind. I mean, I really desire to do that, but I guarantee you, I guarantee you, there's a person right now here on planet Earth, maybe even in this fellowship, in this room, that maybe knows, and I'm not saying this as a comparative thing to me personally or anything, but maybe knows 5% of what I know, just hypothetically. They know 5% of what I know, but they know this, one truth. They don't know the Bible. They can't tell you the books of the Bible. They can't tell you the context of this and the meaning of that and how that applies here, that goes over there. They just know Jesus, and they're going to share they don't care what anybody else thinks, you know. And maybe you've got somebody on the outside looking at me like, man, that guy's an idiot, you know. But, 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 but that's the wisdom of God. And you know, in that person, if they're sharing faithfully, it doesn't matter. They got all that they need in Jesus. They got all the wisdom of God in their relationship with him. And the power of God is placed not on the wisdom of men, not a bunch of education, not a bunch of seminars, not knowing the Bible and memorizing every single word in the Bible, but of simply knowing Jesus through the gospel of God in all its simplicity. That's the power of God. It's laid up, it's rested in, it's infused in the message of Jesus, his death and resurrection for us that we might have eternal life. And them knowing that intimately, that's more powerful than anything else on earth. And the last phrase here in this verse, we have the worship team that want to come out as we share this last little piece. And this kind of ends in a funny way, this chapter. You know, it says, better is wisdom, weapons of war, and, you know, wisdom's despised, as we see there. But one sinner destroys much good. How true is that also? You ever been working on something? <laughs> I do this a lot. Remember, I got three under three. Cleaning up the house or something. <laughs> one kid destroys something. <laughs> You're like, man, I just cleaned this up. You know, one sinner destroys everything. You know, you get that sense of what that means there. And it's true throughout the Bible, right? You know, Adam blew it for all of us. One sin through Adam wrecked humanity. I mean, every bad emotional feeling you've ever had, every horrible experience that you've had in this world, every you know, feeling of hunger, sickness, pain, feeling despondent, disconnected with humans, disconnected with God, all that's attributed back to Adam. You know, we see other cases in the Bible like Achan and Joshua 7, one man's sin hindering them from moving forward into the promises of God. As a nation, we see, you know, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, right? Most prosperous kingdom, God, Solomon had God done through Solomon, destroyed by this one kid. Romans 5.19 tells us this. It says, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Mm. We have to learn to estimate people by not what we see on the outside, but their wisdom and their godliness. I put here as a life lesson that the wisdom of God is often unrecognized and despised by the world, but that we should take heed to it anyway. 
I'm gonna pray. God, we thank you, Lord, tonight is, Lord, we look at our own lives, God. <clears throat> I know as I look at my own life, I, I see that oftentimes I'm, I'm the one that's made a decision that's negatively affected myself, hurt myself, and maybe has hurt others. And I can get really caught up in being discouraged over that. But it's by a, your obedience, Jesus, to the Father, that all things can be made right by the blood, by being forgiven afresh and anew, by a allowing you to create for us a clear and an open path to know what it means to, to follow after you. So we don't have to be trampled over again and again in our sin and living in a life of death and despondency, Lord. Lord, our destiny is eternally changed through one man's obedience, Jesus. That's you. If you're in here tonight, we typically try to open up this time as the worship team plays to, you know, if there's something that's on your heart that you're, you're struggling with that you need to be prayed over for, this altar is going to be open. If there's a sickness, an illness, there is a need for the anointing of oil and elders to be praying over you. Man, don't run away from that promise being yours tonight. God has paid not only the price for our sin that we could have eternal life, but he's, he's given us the, the, just the fullness of his kingdom to experience all the blessings and promises written within his word. So as the worship team plays, we, we invite you as the Holy Spirit leads to respond to him in Jesus' name.
Father, we thank you tonight, Lord. We thank you so much for Jesus. Lord, I think of this story. I think of, Lord, it was the, it was the enemy that was trying to tear down our city, <laughs> trying to tear our lives apart, still kill and destroy us but because of Jesus. Still small voice the one calling us home to a right relationship with you, Lord. Because of you, Lord, our lives was, have been saved because of your obedience to the Father. Through the Holy Spirit, now we can experience the same blessings because we're joint heirs with you. Mm. If you're in here tonight and maybe you've been experiencing to a certain degree in your life, uh, Lord, or that, that the world around you's collapsed and you've, you've been struggling, you felt the, the brunt and the sting and the stench of what sin is and it hurts. But God calls us to, to turn back to turn toward him in our frailty. Believe that his death was sufficient to forgive us and simply calling on him and asking for it. Because we believe, therefore we speak and call upon him to be saved. Whether you're in this room or watching online or listening through a podcast, I would invite you just to, just to quiet your heart before God Realize your need for him and call upon him to be saved or to be forgiven afresh and anew once again, right where you're at. I encourage you to to simply repeat after me out loud, confessing with your mouth what you believe in your heart that Jesus has done for you. The Bible says we're saved. Would you pray with me now out loud? Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, I believe in you. And I believe your death was sufficient enough for me that I could be forgiven of all of my sins. And Lord, I ask that you would forgive me, that you'd come into my heart and be my Lord. Be my God and be my Savior. And give me the power to follow you, serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face and the countenance of his light shine upon you. May he bid you his peace, his shalom, his wholeness, his wellness, his goodness over you. In the name of Hashem, Yeshua, that is the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. God bless you guys.